Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. And welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. This is a place of inspiration, education, and hope for a kinder, healthier, and more sustainable world. On this show, we talk with change makers and thought leaders about the things that matter most to you. Our guests address some of the toughest and most controversial of life's health, environmental, and human rights challenges, offering solutions to us to more easily and effectively face and overcome them. But I'd like to first take a moment to express gratitude to our terrific show sponsor, New Roots Herbal, for making this program possible, Um, in addition to producing terrific supplements. They're literally one of the best here in Canada um, in terms of natural food products. They also develop other unique food products. Um, For example, I just received a a, a beautiful container of the organic lupine uh, seed powder, seed protein powder, which is like a dynamite um, protein source and all kinds of other health benefits. And I'm I'm now kind of scratching my head thinking, okay, what can I do? What kind of recipes can I uh, develop using it? So there's lots of good stuff about them that you can learn more about uh, um, at their website, uh, newrootsherbal.com. I do have some sponsorship opportunities available, so do give me a shout if you'd like to share your products or services with my wonderful audience of hundreds of thousands of monthly listeners. Uh, you can contact me directly through my TeresaNicasio.com website, and that is Teresa with an H, T-H-E-R-E-S-A, and that's N like Nancy, I-C-A, two S's, S-S, and then I-O as an octopus, dot com. Be sure to join us next time when Drs. Deborah Ross Swain uh, and Elaine Fogel Schneider are going to be with us talking about their new book, Confidence and Joy, Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Differences. Um, This is going to be, as many of you have already seen, we've had a huge um, um, uh, empowering youth series. This is going to be an extension of that. It's going to be an amazing show. You're going to love these women. And both these doctors are um, um, really passionate about making a change, especially for those our kids who are the most vulnerable. So uh, tune in next time. But for today's show, we are actually um, kind of starting off our, uh, our, our uh, what would I call it, our GMO awareness, uh, GMO health food awareness uh, series. And this is going to be starting with our Canadian filmmaker, Aube Giraud. She's here with us, and she's going to be talking about her new documentary film that has literally been sweeping the International Film Awards just everywhere around the world um, and with a super big exciting win recently of the James Beard Foundation 2019 prize as the best documentary of the year. So we are super blessed. But in addition to um, uh, her James Beard Foundation win, um, her movie Modified um, has been the official selection at over 60 international film festivals. It's aired nationally in Canada on CBC Television. Uh, it was a recipient of 13 additional awards, and um, it's still it's like sweeping things. And, uh, and when um, I was just say, if you haven't yet seen this movie Modified, it's um, it's this is one you definitely want to see. And it feels a little bit like a, a, not just like a documentary. It's like a crossover of, of documentary documentary and uh, international film, um, uh, yeah, kind of it has a foreign film kind of quality. It's got this really homey quality, but whatever it is, be sure to have your tissues close by when you watch this movie. I literally cry every time I watch it, and I've watched it several times now. Um, 
but in the film, it's 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 amazing how how Obe has been able to um, not only load it with information about genetically modified foods in a really um, in a really accessible way, uh, and talking about ca- how her experience with and what she's discovered, Health Canada and EPA, what their um, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. Um, how their their approaches to it, and unfortunately, their ne- negligent protective measures of the public, which are supposed to be here to protect us. Um, but it's also, like I said, it's a beautiful mother-daughter love story, and it will touch you to the core, and literally, you will dream about it. It will. It, um, uh, you'll hear more about this about Ob and her mom, who they worked on the, pro, the movie together until um, things shifted. Anyway, there's so much more I could say about this courageous and inspiring filmmaker. She's a food activist. Also, she's a blogger. She's a PBS TV show producer. She's got her own show on um, PBS. Um, but for now, I want to just jump right in because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and of course, as always, you can read more about Ob um, on. Uh, uh, on the TeresaNicasio.com website. Thank you so much for being here today oh, and joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me and, and for the lovely introduction. Very honored. Well, absolutely. It's uh, it, it's an honor. It's an honor for all of us uh, listening today. And um, you know, I, let's just start with the personal because I think it's that's where you begin your movie and you begin and end it there too. And uh, this is it's such a, a, a slice of life movie. Um, can you just share with our audience a little bit about uh, this journey about how you became a food activist? Um, you know, tell us about you know, your, how it evolved into then your movie Modified and, and then uh, and your blog and TV show um, and, and the role of your mom in all of this. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up my mom. Um, I always like to say that it all started in my mom's garden, and that's um, also how the film starts. Um, but I I was very lucky to grow up um, with a mom who had a, a big garden, and she grew a lot of the foods that we ate. And so um, I grew up with this um, really intimate connection and understanding of where my food came from. Um, and also just growing up in a family that just was obsessed with food, you know. Um, my mom and I's conversations would almost always revolve around food, whether it was, you know, a new recipe that we had just tried and loved or whether it was um, about the politics of how food um, gets to our, our dinner tables. Um, so... You know, when I was 19 and I I moved away from home for the first time and moved into my own apartment and started doing my own groceries, that was the same year that the first GMOs came on the market. So, you know, right away I was learning how to make my own food choices, um, and there here was this new technology that was being used in our food. So I had a lot of questions about it. and, and so did my mom. And so we would, um, for years, we would kind of trade back and forth, you know, books that we read on the topic. If my mom would, you know, record interviews that she heard on the radio and send them to me. Um, and so this was an area that where we both had a lot of curiosity and wanted to learn more um, about them. And a few years, um, well, several years later, I found myself living in Europe for two years. Um, and in Europe, um, genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, as they're more commonly known, have to be labeled on all the food products there. Um, so when I came back to Canada after living in Europe for two years, I was puzzled um, about, you know, why aren't these um, new products labeled here? Why aren't GMOs labeled here in Canada and in the U.S.? Um, and so that very simple question is what kind of set me off on, on this journey with the film. Um, and, you know, I, I say it's a simple question, but it, it leads into a very complex um, issue, and it, it actually led me into a 10-year journey making the film. So it, it took me 10 whole years to, to make the film. Um, but, um, yeah, that's a little bit of the, the background of how, how I got interested in this whole issue. Right, right. Well, they oftentimes say that we learn through contrast, right? So if things just sort of happen, we don't really pay that much attention. But when there's a stark contrast, as a psychologist, you know, that's what I am, um, that's how we learn. And so here you were, you you had the contrast of being one of the weird kids uh, at school. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. the kids, you know, my kids accuse me of doing the same thing to them, you know, and that's, you know, that, um, anyway, my youngest daughter, one time she's like, oh, mom, you ruined my life with that book of yum. It's like people, it's like I can't eat the, the, the gluten foods and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I'm like a freakazoid basically is how they feel. Um, um, but anyway, I think as they, as they get older, it's, uh, you know, it's a very interesting journey. But uh, what's it like when you, when you reflect now on, um, the time of your life growing up and, and having this weird kind of feeling like a nerd and feel, having this kind of weird family where, where you packed it up, you know, a lot of homemade foods. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, because um, my mom was, she ate everything and she would experiment with everything. And so, um, you know, like I came home one day and there was a giant pot of beef tongues boiling away on, on the stove oh, top. Um, so, like, really weird stuff sometimes. But she yeah. didn't shy away from, from anything new, um, and, she, and she, just, she just loved food, like all food. And then, on the other hand, my stepdad, who I grew up with, was vegetarian, so he didn't eat any of those beef tongues or, oh, or any so um, meat products. So, but, you know, every Saturday he had a ritual where he would make a giant batch of yogurt that would carry us through the week, and he would make all the bread that we would eat um, through the week. And and so, like, food was just, um, I mean, our meals were very eclectic and unusual, and I remember having, like, a friend at school came over for dinner, and the next day she told everyone, like, oh, the family is weird. They eat green spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so had, I think we had, like, spinach pasta, and this was, like, I think it was in the late 80s or maybe early 90s where that was. Right. Now it's maybe a little more common, but at that time it was just very weird that my family ate green spaghetti, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely grew up with this sense of, of like, and, and sometimes having some shame around that with my weird lunches that I would bring to school. But, um, but I think very quickly growing up and starting my adult life um it like food has always been a passion and a love and an obsession of of mine as well so i'm very grateful that 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 is how i grew up right right so you know you were you know a normal kid you grow up and you go off and in the movie it was funny when you're talking about how your mom kept sending you these these books and they were just filling your bookshelf you don't think you're probably rolling your eyes oh mom's reading another book she's such a zealot about this whole this whole food thing in the gmo but then you mentioned that you know one day you cracked one of those books open. but again most teenagers or young people in their young 20 early 20s um roll you know it's pretty normal to roll your eyes with things your mom does um but uh what was it like for you when you it's like you turned a corner at that time didn't you how old were you when when that happened when you finally sort of woke up yeah i was in my early 20s and um and i think you know as i said for me coming into my adulthood and having gmos come on the market at the exact same time it was kind of a a natural um area of curiosity for me where it's like oh this is this is a brand new thing. I'm, you know, I'm learning to make my own food choices for the first time. Let's find out more about this. So, yeah, initially there was the eye rolling and, like, oh, why is, like, my mom so annoying? She's sending me all these <laughs> books and articles all the time. But but very quickly, you know, I I became very curious about it, um, about it myself, yeah. Yeah, and, and wh- whose idea was it to start a documentary? Because you were studying film in the, at York, is that right, eventually? Or? Yeah, exactly, and I had been um, toying with the idea of this documentary. I think it had been percolating for a really long time before that, but I got my start in filmmaking um, when I was quite young. I was on a, I was a, I was around, I think it was, 18 or 19, I was a participant on a cultural um, youth exchange program called Canada World Youth, where I spent, you know, three and a half months in Tunisia with a a Tunisian counterpart, and we both had um, uh, projects in our different communities. So we spent three and a half months in a community in Quebec, and then three and a half months in a community in Tunisia together. And I, my, my work community work project was in a TV station. Um, and so I made my first documentary with them. It was a documentary about our cultural, cross-cultural exchange program. Um, and then I then went on to study visual arts and primarily um, 
doing media arts and video work, which was more like experimental video, but I always had an interest in documentary. So, um, so yeah, the, the film, the idea for this film was, was percolating for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so it was, was it your idea then to, to, to say, hey, mom, because your mom didn't even have an email account, uh, <laughs> uh, to say, hey, mom, why don't we do, why don't we do a film about this? How did that, how did that come about? Yeah, um, I mean, it really came about, I had just come back from Europe and had this question about, you know, why aren't GMOs labeled here? And I had already made um, two short documentaries for the National Film Board um, of Canada, which one of them was also about food. Um, and I was also starting my master's, at, as you mentioned, at York University, my master's in film production. And so initially, actually, the film began as my thesis project um, for wow. York, um, and then it, it became something much bigger than that. And, and I would say, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily that my mom and I embarked on the project together, but she was such a, she was so involved, that, like, at every step of the way. Um, and, and as I got further and further into the film project, and, of course, you know, she passed away while um, I was working on the film, and that after her passing, um, you know, working on bringing the story of the film together with my editors and my co-producer, um, Everyone kept saying, you know, your mom is the heart of this story. Like, this is, she, like, she, she is really the heart, the beating heart of the story, and her, mm -hmm. we need to bring her out more, and we need to bring you out more. And so the film really became a lot more personal um, than I had ever intended. In the beginning, it was more, you know, I wanted it to start in my mom's garden, because to me, that's where everything that's where my interest in food and CMOs and, and all these issues, you know, that's where it came about. But um, but I never had intended for the film to be that personal initially. Yeah, what was that like um, to to have, to share such a personal story? Of? I mean, literally right in your home and, and eventually then as your mom, when your mom got her cancer, brain cancer diagnosis and, and, and died, and uh, that was very, very touching. Yeah, it, it was definitely one of the most um, challenging parts of making the film. And, of course, you know, having my mom pass away is the most difficult thing I've ever gone through in my life. Yeah, and, yeah. and in fact, I, I really stepped away from the film after she died. I really, um, yeah, I had, you know, a, a long grieving period, and I couldn't, I just couldn't even work on the film. And, and also, there was so much footage of her, and I, I wasn't ready to look at it yet for a long yeah. time. So yeah. that, that took a lot of courage to, to kind of crack all that footage open. And, and, and when I did, it was like going through a whole other grieving process. So, so it was definitely very challenging. And, and there were a lot of challenges, like, um, you know, I didn't want... Um, I didn't want people to see her uh, as a sick person. You know, I wanted to show her when she was healthy. But there were, yeah, there were all kinds of challenges like that. Like, what do I want to share with people? What don't I want to share with people? Um, and same with myself being in the film. I mean, I'm not, I'm kind of a, I wouldn't say a shy person, but I'm not, um, you know, I don't love public speaking. I don't love putting myself out there so much. So it was very challenging to put myself in the film and to narrate the film myself. So, yeah, so having the film be so personal, both on the level of having me in the film and also having my mom in the film, those were two huge challenges in, in telling the film story. But what's so interesting now um, having traveled with the film and showing it to so many different um, audiences is that everyone seems to respond very strongly to the personal aspect of the film. And that's always what people come up to me at the end of the film and say, you know, this film really touched me because of your mom, because of you, your narration and your participation in the film. So um, even though it was hard, I'm so glad that that was the direction that it took. Yeah. Well, I just have to say, oh, because, you know, we're going to be getting into more of the um, the ins and outs of what you learned about the GMOs and the pesticides and all that. Um, but the reality is you brought to life this movie. You and your mom brought to life the reality of the impacts, at least some of the impacts on health. 
And you even mention in the movie that you, you know, you're haunted by the um, the possibility because there started to be a lot of heavy pesticide use, um, you know, a lot of the growers uh, near your mom. And even though she grew everything organic, there's, there's the drift. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about that drift, but also feeling haunted by the possibility that, um, and especially given all that we're learning now about the drift and the effects of, of you know, glyphosate and cancer, all the research and now rulings and such, well, again, we'll be talking about, but what's that like, um, uh, sharing that and, and or, or thinking about that, the, the prospect that that may have been why your mom was taken early, ironically, uh, was because of, of the pesticide use and such. Yeah, and it's such a delicate thing to bring up, you know, because, of course, I'll never know why my mom got cancer and why she died. It's, it's something that it's always going to be a mystery. So, um, And I always wanted to be very clear about I'm not making any um, links between GMOs and my mom's cancer. Um, that's not at all what, what the film is, is about. But that yes, as you say, and there is this moment in the film where I say there's always going to be a nagging question that I wonder if my mom's cancer was caused by the pesticide use in our area because I grew up in a very agricultural valley um, with a lot of or a lot of apple orchards, and of course we know that apples are one of the most heavily sprayed um, produce that's out there on the market. Um, so I grew up, you know, watching pesticide trucks go by, you know, spray trucks go by on the, on, on the way to school. Or, or I remember, you know, being at a music concert with my mom um, and the windows were open and we were actually surrounded by an apple orchard. And I remember um, a, a truck spraying literally within meters from an open window and kind of mm. somebody getting up and like, okay, let's close this window. But so I, I really grew up in that kind of environment. And I think um, my mom had a lot of concerns and um, pesticide use. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it is like I say in the film, it is a nagging question that I'm always going to wonder, you know, because as you say, even though she had an organic garden, we were surrounded by, um, by fields and orchards that were heavily sprayed. Yeah, all right. Well, we're going to talk more about the spraying, the, but in particular the policies. The things that uh, Obe learns in particular uh, while doing this documentary film, um, we do need to take a short break, so stick around, folks. We'll be right back right after the uh, few words from our sponsors. Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's NewRootsHerbal.com Audiobooks gives you instant access to over 50,000 of the best sellers and hottest book titles in romance, mystery, fiction, and many other genres. Just visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on Audiobooks to get started. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. YumFoodForLiving.com. That's yum food for living. Com. If you like to spend your television viewing time learning about some of the things that you may have missed in history class, or if history was your favorite subject, then you should check out the link to the History Channel on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page. Order DVD sets by series or by subject matter right from our homepage while you still enjoy your favorite HealthyLife.net show. Being inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. 
To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. You're listening to HealthyLife.net, the radio network that brings positive talk with positive change to make your world a little better. Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just tuning in, uh, we have with us today Aube Giraud. She's a Canadian writer, director, and producer of Modified, uh, which has been the James Beard Foundation winner as the best documentary of this year. It's phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, but in addition to this movie, uh, Modified, uh, a lot of you out there may already know Aube from uh, her TV show, Kitchen Vignettes. Um, it's an online farm-to-table cooking show on PBS, uh, which received the 2019 Saver Magazine Best uh, Food Blog Award because she has the, the show and she's got the food blog that goes with it as well. Um, and she's also, through those uh, um, efforts, she's also a two-time James Beard nominee for her show and her blog. So uh, you know, it's, it's very likely you've seen some of Obe's uh, materials. Uh, but uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about what brought Obe to deciding to do this movie, Modified, and, and a little bit about her and her mom. And, um, and so we would like to talk now a little bit about what, uh, Obe, if you can share with our audience a little bit about what you learned about agribusiness and organizations like Health Canada and the EPA through this uh, journey. Yeah, well, you know, the number one thing I learned is just how much influence corporations have over our food policies, whether it's, you know, our elected officials, whether it's our regulatory agencies like Health Canada and, you know, the um, USDA and EPA um, in the U.S. Um, and, and for me, that, that was one of the most, um, I mean, I wouldn't say startling because I already had um, an inkling that that, that was the case, but, but really... Um, Seeing it with my own eyes, how, how in depth, um, how intertwined um, they are, and for me, the case study of GMO labeling it's, it's a very interesting case study because what it shows is um, the extent to which our governments um, will put policies in place that uh, favor corporations as opposed to citizens. Because with GMO labeling. All the polls over the last 20 years have shown that the overwhelming majority of Canadians and Americans, over 80%, it was um, like 88% some, Canadians, wasn't it? I think 88% Canadian. Yeah, the, I mean, the different polls show different numbers, but it's uh-huh. always over 80%. In some wow. cases, it's over 90%. I mean, whether people are for GMOs or against them, um, they want to see them labeled. They just want to have the information and they want to be able to make their own choice. And mm-hmm. so, you know, what we've seen in Canada, for instance, is GMO labeling bill after GMO labeling bill um, get voted down by our elected representatives when they know that the majority of Canadians want these foods labeled. So to me, it's a very, very clear um, example of where our government is not listening to us. Um, and that's one thing, you know, we talked about my mom earlier, and, and but that's one thing that she strongly believed in is that we have to hold our governments accountable and remind them that they represent us, not corporations. Right, right. Well, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to really capture. I, I, my brain still can't wrap around that uh, 64 countries in the world and this is not new news. This has been going on, uh, have been labeling uh, the, the GMO, and it's been required. I mean, it was a, a virtual little mini French Revolution, uh, in, in, you know, in, in France, too, with the, the people fighting to hold the government accountable and say they have to be labeled. And, um, and uh, you know, so what's, the, what do you, what's different here? I mean, there was that really chilling interview. They had that one fellow where he was saying, oh, it's because of fear and, and uh, you know, kind of a Using you, or, or just basically 
saying, oh, this, this love of small farms is just so, it's very patronizing about it. And, um, so what, what's, what's the deal? How, why is it so different here in Canada and the U.S.? Uh, where, where, and then how, they can get, how can they get away with it? What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that I have one. You know, I think it's a com- complicated um, question to answer. But I think that... Um, I think that on this issue of GMO specifically, we just we just haven't held our governments accountable um, to to what people want, um, and I think that um, for some reason in Europe they've been a lot more successful in just from the very beginning. It was like okay, this is a new technology that is being used on our crops and in our food. People want it labeled. People want to have a choice, so we're going to label it right from the start. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I think that the situation here in North America really shows um, the extent to which, um, you know, the agribusiness industry uh, kind of calls the shots in a way. Um, And, you know, like last night I was watching the the debate, you know, the the Democratic debates here in the U.S., and and it was interesting that this is an issue that, you know, doesn't just apply to GMOs. It's getting money out of politics is... Mm -hmm is, I believe, um, the number one thing that we need to address if we want to properly deal with our environmental issues, with our health issues, Um, because, you know, whether it's the fossil fuel industry, whether it's the tobacco industry, whether it's, as we've seen more recently, the aviation industry, you know, which essentially allowed Boeing to um, self-regulate itself um, mm-hmm. when it wow. came to it to the 737. You know that that information is coming out now that that part of the reason why all those people died is actually because um, the agencies in charge of regulating you know these planes allowed industry to regulate itself and to make its own decisions. And so um, I think that that's also one of the things I learned while making this film is that. This speaks to a much bigger and darker issue. It's not just about GMO labeling. You know that for me, that that is a case study. But what I learned making this film is that um, these are democratic issues. These these are issues um, with our democracies not working properly, where we have allowed um, businesses and industry to have so much lobbying power um, and so much. Um, essentially control over our regulatory agencies, which should be protecting the public. Right. No checks and balances. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, and, and money talks, and a lot of money talks loudly. And so when people are basically, it seems like some of these policymakers are selling their soul for money. It's like, well, we could do the right thing, or we could get billions of dollars, uh, you know, um, and, or millions, if not billions. And so, it's it's really criminal that that the you know Health Canada, you know, by definition, they should be looking after our health. The Environmental Protection Agency, by definition, should be looking out for the environment. And it's been bastardized, it seems. Uh, and and you know, you bring up about the science, quote unquote science, um, that the folks are doing, um, and. and and no accountability. It's, I mean, I, I have a science background. This is like peer, peer-reviewed science is is really the it's the gold standard. And can you talk about how that's sort of somehow that's been um, that's not relevant in? Uh, I guess we have to wait till after break. But to, maybe when we come back, talk about how Health Canada and, and you know, how the policies are there that are making it possible to uh, to not have standard scientific. Um, um, procedures. Yeah, I would love to talk about that because often when you know you criticize GMOs, or even if you're pro-GMO but you just want them labeled, one of the things people come back with is, "Oh, you're against science." <laughs> you know, you're against mm-hmm. progress, you're against technology, you're against science, and I think that there are so many problems with that um, mm-hmm. that opinion. And, and I'd love to get into it after the break. Perfect. Okay, you got. We got our writing orders after the break, so stick around. We'll be right back.
There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yum foodforliving.com. You have too little time to shop, so try Farm Fresh to you. They deliver organic food the way nature intended, delivered straight to your home or office, economically. Visit our web advertiser page and click on Farm Fresh to you now. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five sixty four sixty three. If you're not in the U.S., listen up. SureTrader is one of the most trusted and reliable names in share trading. With 6 to 1 leverage and other perks, SureTrade is the best for penny stocks and day trades. To find out more, visit our advertiser page and click on the SureTrader banner. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. Welcome back. Uh, we're we're here today with uh, Ove Giroux talking about her amazing movie, fantastic movie, James Beard. Um, best uh, best documentary of the year of 2019, and uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of, um, uh, of you know what it's like being a food lover and a whole issues around GMO. And specifically, right before break, we were talking about Health Canada and the environmental the EPA Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S. Um, uh, can you can you carry on, Ob, and talk a little bit about about what's been going on and, and in Canada specifically? There was there was a great thing happened. Uh, was it in uh, 2001 or something for the Royal? What is it called? The Royal Society. Yeah, the Royal Society of Canada, exactly. Well, it, it's one of the um, stories that's covered um, briefly in the film, but for me it was a huge learning experience, which is, you know, if you write to Health Canada or to, you know, your elected representative and you say, oh, you know, I, I want GMOs to be labeled or you express some concerns about GMOs, what inevitably what they'll write back to you is, is to say, um, you know, Health Canada has a robust science-based regulatory system. They know how to evaluate GMOs. Don't worry about it. You know, they've established that they're safe. Um, trust and there's us. A, trust us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and there's a huge problem with that, which is that um, in 1999, the Canadian government um, wanted to reassure the public about GMOs, and so they actually commissioned Canada's highest, most respected scientific and academic body, which is the Royal Society of Canada, to evaluate our regulatory system, whether it's up to snuff. And so in 2001, the Royal Society released its report. It's a, it's an amazing read. It's over 200 pages, but um, if anyone likes to geek out on that kind of thing, um, I highly recommend it, and it's available online. It's also linked um, to on, on our film website, modifythefilm.com. But basically, the Royal Society slammed the Canadian government. Um, the Toronto Star described the report as a polite but scathing indictment of the federal government. Um, and, and what they essentially said is that our GMO regulatory system is not 
um, science-based. It's not rigorous. Um, and and it, it, it needs a lot of changes. It needs to change. And so the report made 53 recommendations for how to fix our broken regulatory system. So um, I can quickly just give a few examples. Um, that would be great. Yeah, so one, one, one thing was they recommended that, uh, because right now when Health Canada assesses a new GMO, it doesn't do its own safety testing. It just looks at the test from industry, straight from the GMO industry. Um, and and this, its assessment of those studies, um, both its assessment of those studies and the studies themselves are actually completely hidden from the public or from independent scientific peer review. So that was one of the number one recommendations of the report, is that the industry studies, which the government uses to assess new DMOs, as well as the, the government's assessment of those industry studies, that those need to be, um, those can't be hidden from the public, and they need to be subject to independent scientific peer review. Otherwise, it's impossible to say that we have a rigorous science-based regulatory system because peer review is one of the, the founding principles of, of the scientific method and of, of, of rigorous science. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was just one of the 53 recommendations. But... Um, you know, some of their other recommendations um, were that our, rec our government should develop the infrastructure needed to assess the allergenicity of GMOs. Right now, they never did that. They, 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 aren't, they have never um, properly evaluated over the long term um, the allergenicity of GMOs. Um, they also recommended that antibiotic resistance marker genes, which are used in the genetic engineering process, shouldn't be used because of the, the widespread problems that we're having with antibiotic resistance overall, and so they recommended that that technique be not used. Um, anyway, the list goes on and on, and they're very um, science-based, common-sense recommendations. And so that was, you know, that came out in 2001, um, almost 20 years ago. Today, our regulatory system is basically exactly the same as it was. Um, when that report came out, our government implemented only two out of those 53 recommendations. Crazy. Essentially, they commissioned this report and then they completely ignored it. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the, the points that is, that is made in the film. And so I think when people say, oh, you're, you're concerned about GMOs, you want them labeled, you're against science, you're against technology. Um, the opposite. It's the opposite. It, it, it is the opposite. To want a good regulatory system is to want good science. It's to be mm -hmm. pro-science. It's to be mm -hmm. pro-democracy, pro-transparency. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's really, really important to, yeah, to make that point. Yeah. Well, and a couple of things that you mentioned, and I realize it was, you know, 53 recommendations, only two. Again, I want you guys to know it's only two have been attended to, and I guess it was even two of the easiest and smallest ones. But, um, uh, you know, myself, I, you know, I have, as, as most people know, um, I wrote that book, which is for, you know, around living with allergies and food allergies, and, and it's not an easy journey. And when you're, when you're messing around with, with genes, and, and proteins, and, and um, when a lot of the, you know, when you're allergic, usually it's the protein, right, that you, um, in, in products that you're allergic to. So if you think you're eating corn, but you're actually eating corn that's been crossed with, let's say, tomatoes, and let's say you have an anaphylactic problem with tomatoes, you're eating corn, you think it's safe, and then um, you can get very sick and die, right? There's, um, this, uh, and there's some, some great advocates out there. We're going to be having Rachel. Rachel Parent on the show in November, um, and she's going to be talking about Kids' Right to Know, her organization she started when she started at like age 11, um, uh, you know, promoting about um, labeling, but there's other, you know, so many other great people out there who are who are trying to point that out, and Caroline Moassasi, and, uh, you know, she does a lot around policies and allergies, and, um, you know, we, we just have these conversations about, you know, she had, you know, her kids were both have, out, live with anaphylactic uh, uh, allergies. This is a massive issue. So this is more than, than what people think about. So all of you out there with food allergies or with people who know people who have them, um, this, is, this is more than the idea, um, which we'll get to in a sec here, of, 
of hypothetically feeding more people, which is, it turns out that's actually more of a belief as opposed to reality. Um, but uh, uh, the other piece is this, this uh, how, uh, that, that glyphosate is an antibiotic. I mean, a lot of this uh, that we're talking about trying to reduce our, our antibiotic vulnerabilities um, and, you know, because we were creating these superbugs, that the biggest use of antibiotics is through all of these pesticides and then the animals eat the pesticides, uh, which are, are also antibiotics as well. So. Um, anyway, so there's there's some huge, huge things here, go, folks. And um, anyway, we do need to go to another break already, but fortunately we have another awesome segment with Aube Giraud. Uh So stick around. We'll be right back. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio, is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's Yum! foodforliving.com Shh! Over here. Here's a secret for a virus-free computer. ESET. They've been a pioneer in the antivirus industry for over 25 years. 25 years of innovative, top-rated antivirus protection. ESET's award-winning security solutions provide a safe online experience for over 100 million home and business computer owners. They are so affordable, fast, and simple to use. So be gone, you blue screen of death. ESET's on my computer. If it's not on yours, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on ESET now. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore or substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. HealthyLife.net, where positive overcomes negative. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just joining us, we're here talking with Aube Giraud about her award-winning documentary, Modified, uh, which is an awesome story of her relationship, an intimate story with her and her mom, um, who was a gardener, a seed saver, a food activist, um, and her mom who also battled and um, fought the battle of cancer while the film's production was underway. Uh, maybe before we, we get into uh, what can we do, because we want to get to that. Uh, Aube, real quickly, can you speak a little bit about um, where, where people can see this film, which is an amazing film that has answered so many questions. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the DVD just got released in the spring, so um, people can go to our film website, which is modifiedthefilm.com, and order a DVD copy there. I know a lot of people don't use DVDs <laughs> anymore, so um, we are having our digital release um, probably next month in September. I don't have the exact date yet, but the film will be available on iTunes and Amazon, and also um, it will be available for streaming on the film's website, which is modifiedthefilm.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and our, our handle is usually at Modified the Film, and for my food blog, it's at Kitchen Vignettes, which is the name of my food blog. Mm-hmm. Great. And, and you know, if you want to do screenings and, you know, get people together, get community action, you can also contact her. And the, the, that contact information is on the TeresaNicasio.com website on OBS page. So uh, be sure to contact them if you're able to do that or wanting to do that anywhere. 
Um, great. So, yeah, this is yeah, you're going to want this this film. You're going to want to see it, watch it many times, and share it with those you love. Um, but you know, we talked a lot about some of this, the the bad news. Um, but but the thing is, we're not helpless, as your mom was such a proponent of. It's you know, what can we do? Yeah, I think there's so much we can do, and I think that what we need, and this is something my mom very much believed in, is we need a complete transformation of our agricultural and food production system. I mean, my film deals with GMOs and and pesticides, but um, the issues are much larger than that. I mean, we currently have an agricultural system where we are literally dousing the planet in herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. We have huge dead zones in our lakes, rivers, and oceans that are caused by fertilizer runoff. We have a plummeting insect population, including pollinators um, like honeybees, like, you know, monarch butterflies that, that we actually need, you know, for, um, for proper pollination of our crops. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. We have antibiotic resistance, which is um, a bigger and bigger problem. We we have all kinds of health issues related to, um, to to pesticides, to carcinogenic chemicals that we are using in our to grow our food. So, um, you know, I think the most important thing that we can do is to um, source our food from farmers that are growing in a sustainable way. Um, and, and to me, that most often means buying certified organic foods, um, although a lot of farmers do um, practice organic methods. They're just not certified organic. Um, but, you know, I think know your farmer is, is, is a really great um, mantra. I think that um, it's so amazing that farmers markets are becoming um, more and more of a place where people go and to buy their foods. Um, so I think just these personal choices that we make, voting with our forks, um, have a huge impact. And, and I want to specifically mention um, the meat, dairy, and egg industry because um, almost all of the livestock, um, you know, the vast majority of livestock is fed um GMO corn and soybeans that have been heavily sprayed with pesticides. And so I think um, one really, and in fact, that's where most GMOs go is to feed livestock. So I think one um, one simple thing that people can do is either to reduce their their consumption of animal products or to um, just make sure to source grass-fed, organically produced meat, dairy, and eggs. Um, but aside from personal choice, I think we can all um, dialogue with our elected representatives, let them know that we care about these issues. Um, and also we can um, contact companies. I often will just call the 1-800 number on a food package and just let them know, you know, I would rather if you um, didn't use products that are sprayed with glyphosate or I would rather not see GMOs being used and I would, I would really like for you to label GMO content on your food product. Little things like that can actually have a huge impact because companies really, really care what consumers think. Um, so there are all kinds of small and big actions that we can take and everyone it's up to everyone to kind of determine what what their own strength or interest is um, even you know gardening growing your own food I think is is a really powerful action that that we can take and it's one that I personally really enjoy um, but yeah there are so many ways that we can take action mm-hmm. great and just real quick do you want to let listeners who aren't aware of, of some of the recent court rulings because um, because there's some you know it's, it's getting more and more solid research about the, the link of, of uh, glyphosate roundup um, and cancer so can you just give a little heads up about a few of the recent court rulings that um, uh, have come out yeah, well, right now, um, Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer, um, they are facing a slew of lawsuits um, by people who have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, who who um, believe that it, their cancer was caused by um, their use of glyphosate. Um, so right now, there are over 18,000 pending lawsuits by um, cancer victims against Bayer. It's a disaster for the company, um, but it's a disaster for the people who who are suffering with this cancer. And um, the I, I'm not sure how many um, lawsuits have 
um, have taken place so far, but I think it's only three or four. But all the victims have won um, their cases in those lawsuits. And, and Monsanto has been found to be negligent. Um, it, it was found that they um, had a very close relationship with EPA officials that um, even though they, you know, they recommended that their workers internally wear protective gear, they never warned the public to do the same. It was uncovered through these lawsuits that basically Monsanto knew that glyphosate could cause harm, but they never, um, they never warned the public adequately. Right. Okay, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today, Obe. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to be having hearing much more because we have this series of more information about some of that. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, be sure to join us next time when we'll be hearing from the authors of Confidence and Joy, Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Disabilities. And I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us today and give special thanks to our sponsor, New Roots Herbal, for making this show possible. I'm Teresa, and this has been the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. Until next time, have a wonderful week. Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's NewRootsHerbal.com VMware is a fresh perspective for virtualization on the cloud. Shaping the future, this all in one platform delivers virtual cloud service on any cloud. Visit our HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on VMware. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five sixty four sixty three. For the best in business class travel, count on Cheapo Air. Cheapo Air has the best price guarantee, 24-7 customer service, and easy booking online or by phone. To experience your hassle-free journey, start by going to HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on Cheapo Air. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, Food is Medicine Health Tips, Easy Allergy-Free Recipes, and Creative Culinary Inventions. The award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio, is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com. Or visit YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net